Okay, well, we're going to get started because it's 9 o'clock. Um, and welcome to worship this morning. For those of you on Zoom, welcome as well. Uh, just a couple of quick announcements. Remember, as you come forward for communion, I'll start this side, Randy will follow, Lynn will start this side, Terry will follow, um, socially distance. Please be sure that you eat and drink at the table, dispose of your product, paper products, and then make sure your mask is returned before going back to your seat. We'd appreciate that very much. The offering plate is up here. If you'd like to put something in, it is not there to take anything out. So um, do create that right. Um, a reminder that we do have Bible study on Wednesday. It's at uh, 9.30 and it's here in this room. We're distanced around tables, large distance around tables. Um, I figure we can have up to 12. We've had 12, but half of them have been on Zoom. So if a few more people would like to come, you're welcome to do that from 9.30 to 10.30. Bring a Bible, wear your mask. We enter through the south entrance door over there and sanitize our hands upon entry. This is Lynn Nagem's last day at the piano. She will be moving on to uh, Hip Replacement City and Wednesday. Wednesday, well, we don't know the time exactly, but as soon as her surgery is scheduled, I'll let you know because we're all going to go down there and demand that we be there. And then we learned also that R2-D2 from Star Wars is coming to perform the surgery. <laughs> you said it was a robot. A robot. Yeah. <laughs> so we, they couldn't find a surgeon to do the hip replacement, so they're bringing in a robot. Um, so that's how we, uh, we hope that she uh, is well and in six months can be back at the piano bench. So I think that's all. Is there anything else? Anybody? Oh yeah, Terry wants me to remind you and everybody else that there is a blood drive. It is September 15th, Red Cross blood drive here, right in this room. Um, it, the last one we had in June was well laid out. Spacing and masks and hand washing and prevention and staying in your car and all that kind of stuff. So the Red Cross did a good job. We had to provide somebody at the entry to take temperatures, and we did that. So if you are willing to donate blood on September 15th, you can sign up for a spot um, right now, either by going to the Red Cross website or by contacting Laura in the church office. Anything else about the blood drive? Yep, okay, as we get closer, we'll perhaps think of something. Yesterday, the um, Wisconsin Council of Churches sent out their update. They do an update on guidance for congregations. Of course, none of it is required. It's not a mandated, lawful thing, but um, they made several recommendations for churches in the state of Wisconsin right now. The first one was not to gather in person, um, which we're doing, and we're going to continue to do that because I think that we have been utilizing some pretty good practices. Our church council has reviewed things, continues to review things, to be sure that we're doing it in the best way possible and that we keep our group size small and that's all happening. So we will continue to um, do as we are doing right now. If you're comfortable with that, you're invited to be here. If you find that uncomfortable, stay home and watch the video recording when Terry puts it up on Facebook later today or tomorrow morning. Um, they also recommended that uh, we not plan on any big gatherings for rally weekend, which a lot of churches like ours do in September as we come back together, so we are not planning to do anything for that. And then the third thing that was rather um, disheartening was that we should start planning now um, to understand that we would not be having Advent and Christmas as we traditionally experience Advent and Christmas in our congregations. And we should look at alternative ways um, for how to celebrate uh, the birth, the, the Advent season, and then the birth of Christ. So um, we'll start doing that, I guess, because I think that based on all of the evidence and the facts that we see in this constant rising of cases and deaths, um, that we, it, won't be, it won't be normal. Um, by Christmas. It won't be normal probably until hopefully sometime in 2021. And then who even knows 
once a vaccine exists, how normal it will be for a long time after that. But anyway, so a few things for us to think about from the Wisconsin Council of Churches. I find that the things that they have to share with us are usually very appropriate and helpful, so we, I take them into consideration along with guidelines from the ELCA and, and the gover government and responsible scientists and all that kind of stuff, and the church council's assistance. And we do have at least one nurse on the church council, and she is adamant, that's Taryn over here, she's adamant about um, making sure that we follow procedures and protocols, so it's good to have her on the council. I will shut up and invite all the rest of you to shut up too. Um, if you're only going to shut up, uh, except you have to sing your solo because who? nobody else knows the words. So thank you for doing that, and we'll prepare our hearts for worship during men's prelude. grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. Let us pray. Holy God, you give us what we need. May we, be willing, may we willingly share those gifts and resources with others so that all will be filled and be saved. Make us mindful of Christ, who gave us an example of compassion and love. Thank you for loving us. In your name we pray. Amen. So for the reading and the sermon, I'm going to slide my mask down and stay far away from you. People told me last night if they were wearing a hearing aid, the mask was really impacted their ability to hear. So I'll put it back up after the sermon. From Matthew 14. Now when Jesus heard about the beheading of John the Baptist, he withdrew from there in a boat to a deserted place by himself. And when the crowds heard it, they followed him on foot from the towns. When he went to shore, he saw a great crowd, and he had compassion for them, and he cured their sick. When it was evening, the disciples came to him and said, This is a deserted place, and the hour is now late. Send the crowds away so that they may go into the villages and buy food for themselves. Jesus said to them, They need not go away. You give them something to eat. They replied, We have nothing here but five loaves and two fish. And Jesus said, Bring them here to me. Then he ordered the crowds to sit down on the grass. Taking the five loaves and the two fish, Jesus looked up to heaven and blessed and broke the loaves. And then he gave them to the disciples. And the disciples gave them to the crowds, and all who ate and were filled, and they took up what was left over of the broken pieces 
there were twelve baskets full. And those who ate were about five thousand men besides women and children. So the old familiar story, feeding of the 5,000 on the mountainside. Remember, there's no little boy in here who runs in with fish, and that's in a different gospel. So the big deal is, is, is this story a true? Is it a true story? Is it historical? Did it really happen? How many people were actually there on the hillside? It says 5,000 men, and there were women and children as well. Did Jesus perform a miracle? Is that what happened in this story? How do you explain the large amount of food that, that happened from five loaves and two fish? And my answer to all of those questions, and probably a whole lot more, my answer is all this is the same. It's the same answer. Who cares? Working out the answers to those questions, as Christians and scholars have tried to do for centuries, doesn't matter. Those answers are not the point, the spiritual point of this story. And the point of this story, and this story is included in all four Gospels, so that suggests it's pretty important because all the writers decided to utilize this story. The point of this story is found in how Jesus answers the disciples. When the disciples went to him, and they wanted him to feed the crowds because it was late at night, actually they wanted him to let them go, go so they could go find food in the village to eat, the answer is what's important. Jesus turned to them and said, you feed them. You give them something to eat. A week ago, we served 43 households in our food pantry. Along the wall, we've got set up entirely different than we used to because of what's all happened. This past week, we ther served 37 households. If you think that a household's an average of three people, maybe, and some of our households are much larger than that, um, think about the number of people that are coming through our food pantry. In July, we broke all records, all records, 168 or 148, 168 households served during four weeks in July. Um, it was just incredible. That large number of weekly guests clearly suggests that people are hungry. And how often do we say a prayer or we hear somebody else speak a prayer at church, it would be me probably, where we ask Jesus or we ask God to feed those who are hungry or to take away hunger. We do that a lot. And today we get an answer to that prayer. We say, Jesus, the people in Madison and throughout the world are hungry and hunger. And Jesus looks us right in the eye today and says, you give them something to eat. Jesus knows that God has provided all the food that the world needs in order to prevent hunger and starvation. Jesus knows that we have the resources in, on the earth to feed anyone who is in need. And so then after he tells us this morning to go and give them something to eat, I think he adds a few things today to us here in Madison in the 21st century. I think that Jesus also says, and I can't help it that the people in your country, the United States, threw away 80 billion pounds of food a year. And then after that, Jesus says, it's not my fault that you and your fellow citizens leave the world in food waste, which amounts to 219 pounds of food per person per year. Jesus says, I can't help it. I can't help it that the number one cause of waste in your country is food spoilage. And it's because you date food and you buy too much food at places like Costco. Jesus told the disciples in today's gospel story, and he tells us again this morning in this room, that God has provided enough food for everyone to eat, and it is now our job to share that food by ending the waste, particularly in America, or in our culture. Now there were a few leftovers in the story, 12 bushels, which isn't a whole lot when you think there were thousands and thousands of fish. Those few leftovers remind us that God will provide a little more, a little extra to spare, but that there is no room for greed or waste, or someone will have to go hungry. 
the message for us in this room? We need to change our lifestyles to fix that problem because we do have the resources. So let's apply that theology of this wonderful little story that we all learned as kids and always and can recite it right back to and anybody. Let's let's take that theology and apply it to several other situations in our country right now. So let's say, Jesus, please, Jesus, end the racism that exists in America. And then Jesus answers us today. He says, you end the racism. And he adds on to that a little bit, I think. He says, you know, I'm not white. You know, God gave you a Bible full of dark-skinned people. And I've come and given you wonderful examples of compassion and forgiveness. You have the tools. Stop abusing God's gift of creation. And then we could go on and say, Jesus, oh please, Jesus, in our prayers, end this pandemic that threatens each of us. And we got to sit in this room today in these goofy masks that are uncomfortable and steam up our glasses and we can't hear one another well. And then he answers us, of course. And you can hear him. He says, you end the pandemic. I've given you what you need. I've given you brains and wisdom and science. And then I gave you masks and hand washing and sanitizer and physical distancing. I have given you wise medical people throughout the world who can provide information about how to decrease the number of positive cases and deaths. And then he says, he throws in this for us, but you seem to be too stupid, and yet I think here Jesus says stupid. You seem to be too stupid to listen and to make use of what I have provided you. In the story today, Jesus reminds us of the phenomenal generosity of God and all of the resources that God has given to us. Jesus reminds us that we don't have to come whining to God with our prayers, asking God to change the circumstances that are troubling us. Jesus reminds us it is our call, yeah, you and me, it's our call to be God's instruments of change on the earth. We are God's instruments to help meet the needs of all others. And then Jesus implores us to go out and to use the remarkable resources that we have. And he reminds us that nothing, this is important, Jesus reminds us that nothing we bring to resolve the conditions, a couple of fish and a few loaves of bread, nothing we bring is too small. So, let us take our talents and our tongues and fix the problems of the world and our culture and our community. You give them something to eat. Amen. The hymn today is, Let us talents and tongues employ, and Verellen will sing again for us this morning.
Jesus calls us in, sends us out, bearing fruit in a world of doubt, gives us love to tell, bread to share, God, Emmanuel, everywhere. Jesus lives again, earth can breathe again, as the word around blows abound. Jesus lives again, earth can breathe again, as the word around blows abound. Thank you again, Mr. Ellen. After sitting side of me for 18 years in choir, she has really come a long way. <laughs> Let us pray this morning. God of the universe, author of creation, giver of life, we come to you for guidance as we seek to use the gifts you have given us for the good of your people. May your Holy Spirit move us to reach deep into our beings and to respond to COVID-19, hunger, racism, poverty, and other forms of oppression in our world. Give us the courage to change our daily lifestyles as needed so that others can share the bounty of a safe and comfortable life. We lift to you the victims and communities impacted by Hurricane Hannah and all those who will be impacted by the tropical storm on the East Coast. Be with disaster relief workers. We give thanks for the progress made in assisting people with a range of disabling conditions. Move each of us to assist all who wish to vote in upcoming elections in our state and nation. Make our systems allow everyone to have a voice at the polls. We ask you to give comfort to anyone who grieves. And through doctors and medical workers, give those who are ill peaceful healing, including Lynn Najan, Georgia, Sandy, Ellen, Mary, and anyone else whom we now name out loud or in the silence of our hearts. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. Amen. God, you take care of us. You gave us the gift of creation and called all things and all people good. You gave us the gift of a Savior who has promised us life with you. You give us the gift of this simple meal to remind us of your presence in our lives and the promises you fulfill. At this table today, we are one. At this table, we are with you. Thank you from the depths of our beings for this supper and for your great love for us. Amen. On the night in which Jesus was betrayed, he took bread. He gave thanks and broke it, and he gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body. It's given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. And then after supper, he took the cup. He gave thanks and he gave it for all of them to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. It's shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of your sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. And together we join in the Lord's Prayer, the traditional words of the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Come and eat. The meal is ready. I would ask Lynn to start on this side, and you may follow. And please remember to distance.
May this body and blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in God's grace. May this feast, which we have longed for, give us courage to go into the world to be evangelists through our words and actions. Amen. Receive the blessing. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord's face shine on you and be gracious to you. May the Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Go in peace. Share the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. <clears throat> so as you depart, I have one little story for you because you have a half a minute and I have to fill it with something because I can't let you go early. So I was on a bike ride on Friday up at, or Thursday morning up at the cottage up in the country. It was wonderful, beautiful, just gorgeous. I went by a farm that I go by often and um, as I was pedaling, a meticulous like hobby farm as I was pedaling by, the dog was on the front yard barking like it always does. Kali, I know it, I've seen it. But so was a, like an 86-year-old man standing in a walker barking at me. And I, I turned and looked and there was a Biden sign in his yard. And as you know, um, that might be the way I go. <laughs> um, so I turned around and I, I wrote back into his yard and I said, you can bark at me all you want as long as you keep that Biden sign in your yard. And he laughed. And, his wife came out and we started talking and, and we talked a lot and then uh, he said to me, where are you from? And I said that I lived in Sun Prairie, Wisconsin and that I had a cottage up on Coons Lake several miles away from there. And he said, well, what do you do? And I said, well, I'm a Lutheran pastor in Madison. And he asked me, are you a happy Lutheran? <laughs> do you know what, that, what he meant by that? In Gresham, all the Lutherans are at Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod. And so he said, are you a happy Lutheran? And I said, oh, I am a happy Lutheran. And my congregation is filled with the happiest Lutherans you will ever find. So you happy Lutherans, get the heck out of here and enjoy the rest of your day.